Welcome to the lecture on my paper, Divine Command Theory, Relativism, and Arbitrariness. I'm Andrew Chapman, and in this lecture we'll be talking about the relationship between God and morality from a philosophical standpoint. That is, what is it about morality that might have to be related to God's existence, God's will, God's nature, or God's commands? Oftentimes, people have thought there needs to be a tight relationship between these things. As we'll see in this lecture, however, there are very good philosophical reasons to think that there is, in fact, no relationship between the existence of God, God's commands, God's will, and the existence and content of objective morality. I say in my paper, a popular theory amongst non-philosophers for the source of morality is that morality is a result of God's commands or will. This theory is known as divine command theory or DCT. According to DCT, an action, A, is morally required if and only if God commands that A is morally required. A is morally prohibited if and only if God commands that A is morally prohibited, and A is morally permitted although not morally required if and only if God commands that A is morally permitted, although not morally required. Even though DCT seems, at first blush, to not only be an eminently plausible theory, but also to be well supported by our standard notions of morality and of the origin of laws, DCT suffers from a fatal defect. This defect was first recognized by Plato in his dialogue Euthyphro, and was laid out in terms of what has come to be known as the Euthyphro Dilemma. Before we get into DCT, what DCT actually says, or what the Euthyphro Dilemma says and why it's a problem for DCT, let's take a quick second and do a brief overview of what ethics is. Ethics, or morality, I'll be using the term synonymously, is the study of the right and the wrong, the good and the bad, the better and worse, the virtuous and the vicious, the fair and the unfair, the just and the unjust, from the perspective of the best overall reasons. Don't let this term perspective mislead you. All that means here is that reasons for doing things and morality are intimately bound up with one another. Thus, the evidence that's employed by ethicists is reason and argumentation. Ethics is an investigative discipline that's concerned with what is true in its particular domain, that is, ethics. Just as, for example, biologists are concerned with determining what's true about particular cell functions, ethicists are concerned with determining what's true about the right and the wrong, the good and the bad, the better and the worse, etc. And just as biologists aren't concerned with what anyone's mere opinion is concerning particular cell functions, ethicists aren't concerned with what anyone's mere opinion is concerning what's right and wrong, good and bad, better and worse. Maybe a historian of science might be interested in what people believe or believed at different times about biology, but biologists themselves aren't concerned with people's mere opinions. Similarly, a historian of philosophy of ethics, an anthropologist, a sociologist might be interested with what people believed at particular times in particular cultures, but that's not ethics. Ethicists are concerned with what's actually true, what's actually the case. This brings us to a very important distinction in philosophy, one that's of foundational importance to ethicists, the distinction between what's known as descriptivity and normativity. Descriptivity and normativity are mutually exclusive properties possessed by declarative propositions. Declarative propositions are ones that represent something as being the case, as being true. There are other sorts of propositions, for example, interrogative propositions are ones that ask a question. Declarative ones are just the ones that say, this is what's going on. And there are two sorts of those, descriptive ones and normative ones. Descriptive propositions are those that express that the world is, was, or will be some particular way, and a descriptive proposition is true if and only if it accurately represents the way the world actually is. 
not what somebody believes about the world, what somebody has evidence for about the world, but if the world actually is that way, then a descriptive proposition is true. Normative propositions, on the other hand, are those that express that the world ought to be, ought to have been in the past or ought to be in the future some particular way. And just as with descriptive propositions, normative propositions are true if and only if they represent the facts about morality, about what ought to be the case. And the descriptive normative distinction is also called the is-ought distinction by philosophers, just as a shorthand. You can see that descriptive propositions are about what is, normative propositions are about what ought to be. When we're discussing ethics, it's also important to keep in mind a number of conceptual distinctions between what morality is and what morality isn't. If we don't keep these distinctions in our minds, it's easy to get confused about what we're talking about and to start either talking past each other or to start making arguments that equivocate about the important moral terms and concepts. First, morality isn't law. Sometimes the law is an expression of morality. Sometimes the law is formed because of our best moral evidence. But sometimes the law gets morality wrong. And sometimes we have to change the law in order to make moral progress. Morality is not reward and punishment. Sometimes we're rewarded for doing the right thing. Sometimes we're punished for doing the wrong thing. But sometimes we're punished for doing the right thing. And sometimes we're rewarded for doing the wrong thing. Sometimes nobody notices that we've done the right or the wrong thing. And there is no reward or punishment. Morality is different from motivation. Sometimes we really want to do the right thing. We're motivated to do what's morally correct. But sometimes we're motivated in the opposite direction. For example, sometimes we've perhaps made a promise to somebody and we are feeling lazy. We don't feel like fulfilling our promise. So we're motivated away from doing the right thing. It would be great if we were always motivated to do the right thing, and part of our moral education, our becoming a better person, is recognizing what's morally correct and trying to get our motivation in line with what's morally correct, but they're not exactly the same thing. Morality also isn't the same as just commands or threats. Somebody might tell you to do something, they might command something, but that doesn't make it moral. Somebody might threaten you, but that doesn't make what they're saying the right thing to do. This is closely tied with issues of law, reward, and punishment. Just as the law, reward, punishment aren't morality, commands and threats aren't morality either. Morality isn't, it also isn't the same as somebody's mere beliefs. I might believe that the right thing to do is to give money to some particular charity, but that charity might not be a good, a morally good charity. I might have gotten something wrong there. So just because somebody believes something, they have a particular set of moral beliefs that they think are the right ones, they could be wrong, just as somebody could be wrong about what the correct biological theory is, what the correct astronomical theory is. Finally, morality is not the same as claims to morality. No matter how loudly I proclaim that I have the right moral theory, no matter how persuasive I am about my claims to have the right moral theory, I still might be wrong. Somebody's claims are not the same as morality in the same way as somebody's claims about biology are not the same thing as the biological facts. Now, as I said, it's important to keep these things in mind when we're doing morality so that we don't get confused, so that we don't talk past each other, so that we don't equivocate on important philosophical concepts or terms. Now, sometimes when people are talking about the relationship between God and morality, what they really mean is that they're talking about the relationship between religious belief or religious practice and individual human behavior. Now, these aren't the same thing as the relationship between God and morality. When we're talking about somebody's religious belief, well, their religious belief could be false. So it might not track what God has actually said. And individual religious behavior doesn't say anything about morality. Some people might just get things wrong in their behavior. That doesn't tell us what the moral facts are. However, if you're interested, here are uh, a whole bunch of facts about 
uh, the relationship between religious belief, religious practice, and individual behavior. Now these are sociological facts, not philosophical facts, so all they do is generalize from particular instances of behavior. This is from a 2009 meta-study that was done by uh, a gentleman named Phil Zuckerman. There's a negative correlation between the safety of a major city and the religiosity of the country that city is in. The more religious a country, the less safe you'll be in that country's major cities. There's a negative correlation in the United States, uh, in states between murder rates and the religiosity of those states. The more religious a state, the more likely you are to be murdered there. The less religious a state, the less likely you are to be more murdered there. Non-religious Americans have lower divorce rates than do religious Americans. If you think that the divorce rate says something about morality, well, there's this negative correlation between religiosity and divorce rate. American teenagers who make religiously motivated virginity pledges, that is, vows not to have premarital sex, are not only just as likely to engage in premarital sex as are their peers who didn't make such pledges, but the premarital sex had by those who made religiously motivated virginity pledges is much more likely to be unprotected sex, both unprotected in terms of preventing unwanted pregnancy and in terms of preventing the spread of sexually transmitted infections. More secular nations are more likely than those that are more religious to provide aid in greater amounts to impoverished and developing nations. The more religious your nation is, the less likely it is that that nation will provide aid to impoverished and developing nations. And finally, a whole grab bag of negative things, anti-Semitism, authoritarianism, dogmatism, ethnocentrism, nationalism, racism, and government-sponsored torture are all positively correlated with the religiosity of a country while the levels of education in a country are negatively correlated with the religiosity of a country. Now, as I've said, all this tells us is about some sociological facts, but there is no claim that an intellectually honest person can make that higher levels of religion make individuals better. Of course, we all know religious individuals who are excellent because of their religion, but we also know individuals who are excellent that has nothing to do with religion. We also know individuals who are awful because of their religion. So looking at anecdotal evidence isn't going to tell us anything. We need to look at uh, massive meta-studies like the one I've gotten this data from. But again, as I've said, this isn't really a philosophical point, just a sociological point that um, the more religious something is, it tends to not be all that great. What we're really concerned with in this lecture is the relation between the source and existence of morality and God. Is God related to where morality comes from? Is God related to whether morality exists or not? The claim that God and morality are related to each other is known as divine command theory. Here's a formalization of that theory. Divine command theory says that for any action, A, where A is just a variable, you can put any action you please in there, that action is moral if and only if God commands A. That if and only if there means that we've got a biconditional, so that implies two different statements. One, if God commands something, that thing is a moral requirement. And two, if something's a moral requirement, it must be because God has commanded that thing. So, if helping others in their times of need is a moral requirement, it's a moral requirement in relation to God's commands. If not speaking ill of others behind their backs is a moral requirement, then it's a moral requirement in relation to God's commands. Note that DCT, Divine Command Theory, is a theory about the source of morality, about both where morality comes from and why morality has the specific content that it does. It's important to recognize the narrowness of the scope of DCT. 
DCT is only talking about the source of morality. Here are a bunch of things that DCT is not talking about. So just as it's important to know what DCT is, it's also important to know what DCT isn't, so we don't make mistakes when we're talking about whether DCT is plausible, whether it's true, what the good reasons are for believing DCT. First, DCT is not a claim about the source of praise or blame. Second, it's not a claim about the source of reward or punishment. Third, it's not a claim about the source of moral knowledge. Fourth, it's not a claim about the source of moral motivation. And fifth, it's not on its own an argument for or against the existence of God. So we don't want to confuse claims about where punishment comes from, how we'd be held responsible, how we would become motivated to do the right or wrong things with DCT. DCT is just a claim about the relationship between God and morality, where God is the source of morality. Since we're talking about God, it'll behoove us to talk about very briefly who or what God is. There are many different conceptions of the divine. However, there's a picture of the divine that's shared by the Western Abrahamic monotheistic religions of Christianity, Islam, and Judaism. And uh, Christians, Muslims, and Jews account for about 53% of the world's population. So even though that's only a slight minority, we can say that this picture of what the divine is is at least the majority picture in the world. According to this picture, God has the following eight features. One, God's omnipotent, meaning he's all-powerful. Two, God's omniscient, meaning he's all-knowing. Three, God's omnibenevolent, meaning he's all good. Four, God is personal, meaning he's a person. He has the ability to do things that persons can do. Five, God's the creator of the universe. Six, God's separate from creation. He isn't identical with the universe or in the universe. Seven, God is self-existent. That is, God's nature explains God's own existence. And eight, God's eternal. He has no beginning or end in time. Now, there's quite a bit to be said about each one of these properties of God and how they relate with each other, and there's a whole philosophical subdiscipline known as the philosophy of religion that investigates what God is, God's nature, and how God's divine properties interact with each other and how they can be interpreted in the most plausible way. We won't be going into that more in this lecture. So why is it that people think that God must be related to morality as the source of morality? Generally, the thought is based on something like an analogy between morality and the laws passed by a legislature. I'll call this the legislative analogy. We all know that local, state, and federal laws bind us in such a way that if we break one of those laws, we've done something wrong with respect to to the law. The laws have a sort of normative force on us where we ought to behave in accordance with the laws because those are the laws. However, those laws that have a sort of normative force that binds us have that ability to bind us, have that normative force because of lawgivers. These laws require lawgivers in that they wouldn't exist and they wouldn't have the specific content that they do without a legislator, a legislature populated by legislators who have the authority to create these laws. Thus, laws require lawgivers. But, Morality is just a set of laws. Sure, it's somewhat different from the local, state, and federal laws, but it does tell us what we ought to do in the same way as those laws tell us what we ought to do. And if laws require lawgivers, then the laws of morality require a lawgiver. That lawgiver, though, has to have a sort of sovereignty over us such that the lawgiver has both the authority and the power to create these moral laws that bind us. God's the only sort of thing that has such a sovereignty over us, thus moral laws derive from God, the ultimate lawgiver. 
There's a lot to be said about this analogy and the argument that is implicit in the analogy, but I'll leave it here for right now. Now, unfortunately for divine command theory, the theory itself suffers from a fatal flaw that was introduced by Plato. It was introduced by Plato in his dialogue, The Euthyphro, which was written about 499 BC. This is um, uh, not accurate, not exactly accurate. It's dated to uh, about five years uh, within uh, 499, uh, 399 BCE, but this is pretty close. The Euthyphro dilemma is a problem for DCT because it presents two options as interpretations of DCT and says these are the only two options. However, both of the options is a false solution to the interpretive problem of DCT in that they both look like bad interpretations of DCT. A dilemma presents two die propositions, lemma, both of which is no good. And each of the solutions has come to be known as a horn of the dilemma, so that's how I'll talk about it here. Remember that DCT says that for any action, A, the action's moral if and only if God commands A. Well, says the Euthyphro dilemma, there are two interpretations of DCT. The first one, the first horn of the dilemma, is that for any action, A, God commands A because A is moral. The second horn of the dilemma is that for any action, A, A is moral because God commands A. These are very similar to each other, but note the difference. In the first horn, God commands things because they're moral. In the second one, things are moral because God commands them. Now, since this is a dilemma, there's supposed to be something wrong with each one of these interpretations. So let's look at them in turn. Just briefly, however, if there's some third interpretation of DCT that isn't captured in one of these two interpretations, then that would show that we don't actually have a dilemma here. Maybe we could accept that third um, option for interpreting DCT. Unfortunately, for the past 2,500 years or so, people have been offering interpretations of DCT trying to escape this dilemma, and no one has offered a plausible third interpretation of DCT. So I'll leave it to you to try to figure out whether there is another option for interpreting DCT. Let's turn now to the first horn of the dilemma. Recall that the first horn of the dilemma said that for any action, A, God's commands, A, be, uh, God commands A because A is moral. So here's the story that would make sense of that. God examines all of the actions that he could command. So he thinks about each one of them. Uh, here is torture, here is charity, here is respect, etc. In order to decide whether he should command some particular action, God checks to see whether the action is moral or immoral. If the action's moral, then God commands it, and if the action isn't moral, then God commands against it. Recall what this interpretation said. It said that God commands things because of their moral status. So God just checks their moral status and commands them. This seems pretty uh, intuitive. The problem here, though, is that God's commands are irrelevant to the moral status of the actions that he ends up commanding. Actions have their moral statuses independently of God's commands. In fact, it's the moral statuses of actions that lead God to command what he does and not the other way around. If God had just decided never to command anything at all, that wouldn't have changed the moral statuses of the actions. They would have been unaffected. So the conclusion here is that according to this horn of the dilemma, God is irrelevant to the moral status of actions. God has nothing to do with whether an action is right or wrong, good or bad, moral or immoral. This is not a great interpretation of DCT for the divine command theorist, 
because this says that God isn't the source of morality. Things are already moral or immoral, independent of God. Now, this is not saying that this is a challenge to God's omnipotence. Sometimes I have students who say, well, this would prove that there's some other God that is uh, imposing his will on God. This doesn't bring anything about that into this interpretation. All this is saying is that actions have their moral status as independent of God. It doesn't talk about whether God is all-powerful or whether there's another God or anything like that, that would require some additional philosophical work if you wanted to argue in that direction. All we get is that God is irrelevant to morality here. So since this isn't a good interpretation of DCT for the divine command theorist, let's look at the other horn. Recall that the other horn of the dilemma says that for any action, A, A is moral because God commands A. So here's the story. God examines all of the actions that he could command. Again, he looks at, for example, charity. He looks at torture. He looks at beneficence, etc. And in order to decide whether he should command some action, he checks to see whether the action is moral or immoral, just like in the previous story. However, actions don't have moral statuses yet because it's God's commands that give actions their moral statuses. There's nothing for God to check yet, because it's up to God whether an action is moral or not. Before God commands whether an action is moral or not, actions are morally neutral. They have no moral status at all. So what's the problem here? The problem is that even though God knows all things that uh, can be known, and even though God is all good, such that he would never command something that we shouldn't be doing, there's nothing for God to know about the moral statuses of actions, since actions don't have moral statuses before God commands the particular actions. Thus, God has no good moral reason for commanding the actions that he does. He couldn't have any good moral reason since he creates the moral facts via his commands. Thus, God's commands, and hence the content of morality, are arbitrary. There's no good reason behind morality. Morality is just random. Now remember, this isn't saying that there's something that God doesn't know. God knows all the true things. The problem is there's no true thing to know yet because God is the creator of morality, according to this interpretation. And it's not as though we could say, well, God could just look to see whether an action would cause pain, because God would still need to know whether pain was morally bad, and God hasn't created the moral rules yet. Or we couldn't say that God could look to see whether um, commanding a particular action would cause society to come crashing down, because we would need to know, or God would need to know, whether causing society to come crashing down is a bad thing morally, but God hasn't created the moral rules yet. So what we've really got here is a chicken and egg problem. Which comes first, morality or God? If morality comes first, then God's irrelevant to morality. If God comes first, then he has no reason to command what he does, and morality ends up being arbitrary. Now what's so bad about arbitrariness? We generally like to think that morality tells us what we actually ought to do for good reasons. It's not just that morality is identical to some command and there's nothing more to it than that. If God commands something, it's because that's the best thing to do. God's letting us know what a good thing is. You might even think that if God's all good, God wouldn't arbitrarily tell us to do things. That doesn't sound like what a good person would do. Just tell us to do things for no reason. So, we've got two horns of a dilemma. Both of them seem very bad. The best interpretation of DCT seems to reduce morality to an arbitrary set of commands that have no reasons behind them. Thus, if we've got a dilemma and both of the horns of the dilemma are bad, we should reject the thing that caused the dilemma. And what that means for us is that DCT is false. Divine command theory, it's not true, and that's been demonstrated by the Euthyphro dilemma. And we can put the falsity of DCT in a number of ways, but let's just look at the two ways, uh, two of the ways that we've been talking about here. 
If divine command theory is true, then one of the horns of the Euthyphro dilemma has to be true. Those are the only two possible interpretations of divine command theory. However, neither one of the horns of the Euthyphro dilemma is true. They're both awful interpretations. We should reject both of them. Therefore, divine command theory is false. Or, let's look at this another way. If divine command theory is true, then morality is arbitrary. If we really want to tie God and morality to each other, the only way to do that is to make morality arbitrary. But morality is not arbitrary. Morality tells us what actually is the best thing to do. It doesn't just tell us some random, non-reasonable set of rules. Therefore, DCT must be false. There are a number of other ways that you can use the Euthyphro dilemma to come at the falsity of DCT. These are just two of them. And I should note that it's, uh, the problems with DCT run much deeper than just the Euthyphro dilemma and the arbitrariness of morality. Many philosophers have looked at DCT and said there are, um, there are, are tons of problems with DCT as an explanation of where morality comes from, the source of morality. We should recognize that DCT is in fact a form of relativism, and as such it inherits all of the problems of relativism. Moral relativism is the thesis that morality is relativized to or determined by some thing over and above the moral facts. So in determining what the moral truths are, in determining what the moral facts are, we need to look at some extra thing, the relativizing factor. The most popular versions of moral relativism relativize morality to particular cultures or groups or traditions or institutions, but whenever you have a version of morality that says that something over and above just the facts makes morality what it is, you've got a form of relativism. The central problem for relativism has always been how to ground morality so that morality doesn't end up just merely being a set of arbitrary rules with no reasons behind them. If it's just some group or culture or tradition or institution that determines what is moral and immoral, unless the group had some good reason for making the decisions that they did, then morality is arbitrary. But if it's the group or culture, institution, tradition that ends up making up the moral rules, what good reason could they possibly have given that they make up the only possible reasons there are? If there are already reasons in place for why we should accept some moral rules rather than others, then it's those reasons rather than the culture or tradition or institution that is responsible for morality. Now notice that DCT is just a version of relativism. It's a version of God-centered relativism. According to DCT, morality is not absolute, but it's dependent on God's whims. But since God could not have had any good reason for deciding what he did about morality, since there were no good reasons for God to use, God's commands are arbitrary, and so DCT is a version of relativism and subsequently it makes morality arbitrary. Now again, resist the urge to say here, well, God would have had good reasons for what he commanded because he's God. Of course, God knows everything. God has all the power. God is all good. But God, if he creates the moral law, couldn't have appealed to the moral law in order to figure out how to create the moral law. God wouldn't do anything wrong. You're absolutely right there. But arbitrarily commanding things isn't doing anything wrong because the things he commands are the moral law. Now what about that legislative analogy that we use to motivate DCT to begin with? That seems pretty plausible, so let's look back at that and see why it's not actually an apt analogy for divine command theory. So recall, we said that laws created by legislators have a sort of normative force. They have the ability to bind us. These laws require lawgivers. These laws wouldn't exist. They wouldn't have the specific content that they do without a legislature populated by legislators who have an authority to create these laws, and thus laws require lawgivers.
But here's where the analogy breaks down. Think about how a legislature works. In legislatures, the individual legislators have good reasons, maybe not reasons you agree with, maybe not productive reasons, but they at least have reasons for making the legislative decisions that they do. When legislators make laws, they don't just pull them out of thin air. They don't just make them arbitrarily. They appeal to complex considerations, including the will of their constituents, the party line, donors, economic factors, relevant domestic and foreign policies. So they have reasons that they can appeal to when they're coming up with laws. It's not the case that legislators create the laws ex nihilo from nothing. But that's what God is supposed to be doing. Legislators have antecedent, very good reasons to make the laws as they do, but God couldn't have had any antecedent, very good reasons because he's to be, supposed to be the creator of all the very good reasons to begin with. So the legislative analogy breaks down. Our laws require lawgivers, but the lawgivers appeal to good reasons in making the laws. God couldn't have. Now let's look very briefly at what this says about the existence of God. On its own, and it's so important to recognize this, divine command theory has absolutely nothing to do with the existence of God. And so the fact that divine command theory is false has absolutely nothing to do with the non-existence of God. Now, some people have tried to tie divine command theory into arguments related to the existence of God or the existence of objective morality. But since divine command theory is false, we shouldn't try to do that. Here are a couple such arguments. One, divine command theories. Two, two, objective morality exists. Therefore, God exists. Well, this is a valid argument. But since divine command theory is true, the fact that objective morality exists, excuse me, since divine command theory is false, the fact that objective morality exists has nothing to do with whether God exists. Objective morality can exist with or without God. It's just that God's commands have nothing to do with objective morality. So objective morality has nothing to do with God's existence. What's known as the moral argument for the existence of God is this. And it's not a good argument because divine command theory is false. Another argument, divine command theory is true, but God doesn't exist. This is an argument an atheist might give you. Therefore, objective morality doesn't exist. Well, if you think that the only way for there to be objective morality is for God to have commanded it, and you're an atheist, then you should assume that objective morality doesn't exist. In fact, we've seen a number of atheist journalists, popular atheists who write books, say that morality doesn't exist. It's nothing but a series of conventions that has no normative force, and the way they get there is by accepting divine command theory. What a bizarre thing for an atheist to do, to accept divine command theory, and then, since the atheist doesn't believe in God, to throw out morality. But again, DCT is false. We've seen why. And so we should reject both of these arguments since their first premise is false. And again, this has absolutely nothing to do with whether God exists or doesn't exist, with whether objective morality exists or doesn't exist. We would need to give independent arguments about the existence or non-existence of God, the existence or non-existence of objective morality. All we know from the Euthyphro Dilemma is that divine command theory is false. So let's finish with why we should attempt to save DCT, if at all. People have been attempting to do that, to save DCT, since Plato wrote the Euthyphro. For recent examples, philosophers William Lane Craig and Robert Adams, among many others, have created what they've called modified versions of divine command theory that they claim don't fall victim to the Euthyphro uh, dilemma. And uh, you should know that very quickly, um, both of these versions of divine command theory have been shown to fall victim to the Euthyphro dilemma. In fact, 
there hasn't been a time when someone has come up with what they claim as a plausible reformulation of divine command theory that it hasn't been shown right away that that version of divine command theory falls victim to the Euthyphro dilemma. So here's a question that we should ask ourselves, a question that we should ask William Lane Craig, Robert Adams, and others. Why are we uh, trying to attempt to save DCT in the first place? The falsity of DCT doesn't have anything to do with the existence of God or with the truth of any particular religious tradition or with the existence of objective morality. What good is DCT? It just seems to be getting in the way here. All the reason, all the evidence we have is that DCT is false. If we want to be good Christians, good Muslims, good Jews, good whatever, or good believers in objective morality, we don't need to buy DCT. It has nothing to do with any of this. It's a red herring. It's sending us in the wrong direction. Now, if after listening to this lecture, you yourself are tempted to rebel against the Euthyphro dilemma, to insist that there must be some way around the Euthyphro dilemma, that DCT must be true, I recommend that you ask yourself what your motivation is. DCT is false. And on top of that, it's so simplistic, and it looks ad hoc, tacked on after the fact, to try to relate God and morality to each other. Why would we want such a theory to be part of our philosophy or part of our theology, part of our honest, mature, rational, reasonable thinking about the ultimate questions, such as the nature of objective morality or the existence of God? We should jettison DCT because... There's never been any good evidence in favor of it, and all the evidence we have is against it. In this lecture, we've taken a look at the relationship between God and morality, specifically in terms of a theory known as divine command theory that claims that an action is moral if and only if God commands that action. We saw that Plato's Euthyphro dilemma, which comes from his... Um, 399 BCE or so dialogue, the Euthyphro, the Euthyphro um, puts us into a position of either saying that God is irrelevant to morality or that morality becomes arbitrary and there's no good reason to do what's morally required of us. Well, since both of those are bad conclusions for the divine command theorist, the best option we have is to jettison divine command theory while also recognizing that divine command theory has nothing to do with the existence of God, nothing to do with the existence of objective morality, and that we would be better theists, atheists, agnostics, believers in objective morality, disbelievers in objective morality, to jettison DCT and get on with our philosophical and theological theorizing. Thank you.